Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our IC10 overview webinar, the first in our IC10 series. We've got a pretty good sized group on the call with us now, so we'll go ahead and get started by going over a few introductory things while the rest of the participants join us. So just to introduce myself, my name is Lori Olson, and I'll be your trainer and host today. I've been with ASCOMP since 2001. There's a picture of me right there with my ASCOMP ring. I got it my 10-year anniversary. And a more recent picture of me at one of our ASCOMP events that we hope you've had the opportunity to come down and join us for. Um, my pride and joy is my family, and I just celebrated 16 years of marriage. Um, another little fun fact about me is that I love snowboarding. So if you haven't had the opportunity to meet everybody before, here's a more recent picture of our crew today. We've got a great bunch, and we really enjoy what we do and who we work with and um, who we serve. Our purpose at ASCOMP is empowering small practices to deliver the best care. It's at the heart and soul of everything that we do, and the reason why we come into work every day we really appreciate the opportunity that we have to be a part of your lives and your practices um, because we know how important it is what you're doing for your patients. A little bit of housekeeping. The webinar today is going to last about 30 minutes. Um, you can type your questions below and we'll try to respond shortly. Uh, we are recording the webinar, so you will get a copy of that webinar of this webinar when it's over. So another little fun fact about me, I love Chipotle. It's always nice when you go into a restaurant to know what's included as you're going through the line and what's not included. So I'm going to apply that same principle to our webinar today. Uh, what is included today, sorry about that, is that I, we're going to talk about ICD-9 versus ICD-10, a little bit of history of ICD, some myths and facts surrounding ICD-10, some of the benefits of ICD-10, um, some of the potential impact on small practices and what you need to be doing next. Um, so just so the cost of the guacamole won't be an extra surprise for you, what we are not going to be covering today is how to properly code using ICD-10, how to bill with ICD-10, and we're not going to get into the specifics of the how to use the software today. Uh, we do have other webinars in this series where we will be getting more of a dive into the software and those features. But today we're going to stick to the overview. Just a little disclaimer, we make every effort to ensure that the information that we're providing you is true and accurate at the time that it's presented. However, as you know, rules and regulations are constantly changing with CMS, and ultimately it's up to individual providers to make sure that they're remaining abreast of all those changes. So. A little bit of terminology. The first thing is CPT, which stands for Current Procedural Terminology. Um, one of the questions when we get with IC10, of course, is how it impacts our CPT code. So just to kind of review what CPT is, it's, it indicates what was done for the patient, not why it was done. It's typically a numeric value consisting of five-digit code that's found on your claims. Examples would be the visit type, the procedures, or the labs. Um, CPT codes are updated annually. However, they, there will be no significant change to them in October 2015. So you'll continue to use the CPT codes that you do today other than any updates that you may have just from the annual updates um, each year. So IT ICD, on the other hand, stands for International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems. And I think that definition of what it stands for is actually very telling of why we're making that change to ICD-10. It is the most widely used statistical classification system for diseases in the world. Um, the use of the standardized coding helps improve consistency among physicians in recording our symptoms and diagnosis. And it is what we use on the claims to indicate to insurance carriers why something was done or provided to a patient. So what is the difference between ICD-10 and ICD-9? 
the first thing to note is that the ICD versions, um, the 9 or the 10 after ICD, just in, indicates the actual revision number. So even though the codes are updated annually, a major change to the structure is what we would consider a new revision, and that's why we are replacing IC9 with IC10, because as you can see here in this diagram, the actual structure of the codes is changing. There are two types of ICD-10 codes. I know there's there's lots of numbers out there about how the, the amount of codes are changing and things like that, but it's important to understand the two types of codes so you can more appropriate, appropriately assess the impact it's going to make on your practice. So ICD-10-CM simply stands for clinical modification. There's about 68,000 diagnosis codes um, under ICD-10-CM. They're primarily used by physicians to indicate the diagnosis associated with the services that are provided. So they're used in clinical settings such as the physician's office. So for our small practices that are billing on a normal claim, the, these are the codes that are going to be impacting you. ICD-10 PCS, on the other hand, stands for procedural coding system. There's over 72,000 procedure codes. And those are used for inpatient procedure reporting, so primarily used in hospitals. While you may encounter them, you are likely not billing for them on your claims in the small practice. So just a kind of high-level overview of a comparison between IC9 and IC10. Um, they differ in several ways. You can see under IC9, we are limited to five characters. We can now expand up to seven characters in IC10. We have some more antiquated terminology under ICD-9. We'll be updating the more current terminology where we used to um, be classified by injury by type. We're, they're now injury group by site and then type. There's an expansion of the chapters. Um, under ICD-9, there was only two alpha characters um, included. And that was either an E or a V to indicate injury or routine diagnosis. Under ICD-10, all the codes will now be alphanumeric, so they will, and and we're not limited to just E or V. The whole alphabet is available. Um, we didn't have it all under ICD-9 any code extensions for for specificity and laterality, and a new feature to ICD-10 is that we now have dummy placeholders for the development of new codes in the future. Some examples of new features that are available under IC10 that we did not have under IC9. One would be laterality. So in the code itself, we can now indicate left, right, or bilateral in many cases. There's a whole new um, type of code called a combination code. So what used to be one single ICD9 code, um, or sorry, what used to be two different IC9 codes can now be reported under one single ICD-10 code because we're associating symptoms with the actual manifestations themselves. Um, there's inclusion of, of, of new concepts that were not existent in ICD-9. Um, and for our under obstetric codes, we're now able to identify the trimester instead of just the episode of care. And then there's been a number of codes that have been also significantly expanded. So some examples of those would be injuries, diabetes, and substance abuse. So one of the common things that we hear um, across the board is that there are just simply too many codes now under IC10. It's kind of easy once you see how the codes have expanded, why the codes have expanded. Um, and there was an excellent presentation that CMS put out, but, and Dr. Joe Nichols made a comment in that presentation that, where he said, there's a lot of words in the dictionary, but that doesn't seem to bother any authors. And I thought that was a great explanation of ICD-10. The expansion of codes can be related to the fact that there's over 50% of them that are related to the musculoskeletal system. 25% of those codes are related to fractures, over 62% of the codes of fractures are simply distinguishing between left and right. And he also pointed out that there might be 1,800 codes for a simple for a fracture of the arm, um, and that could seem daunting, but there's really only about 50 concepts that are being 
um, used and repeated in different patterns. So the takeaway from all of that is a little reality check here. And that is that even today with the codes that are available, only about uh, only a very small percent of the codes are being used by most providers. So you saw in that example before, some of those changes that have increased the number of codes might not have the same impact on your specialty. Today, there's only about 5% of IC9 codes that account for over 70% of the charges. So even though the codes that they're expanding, um, please don't be overwhelmed. <laughs> um, the, a general, as a general rule, all physicians no matter what their specialty, are going to see an increase in the codes. But depending on your specialty, that impact can vary greatly. So there are some specialties where the, the number of codes that you're going to be using have gone up drastically, as you can see towards the bottom of this chart. Orthopedic, you know, dealing with the musculoskeletal system and fractures and things like that, the number of codes has increased drastically. They're the most you know, hardest hit, I guess you would say, by the number of codes that are available. Um, but on a varying scale along there, you can see cardiology at the top not quite as impacted. So again, depending on your specialty, that impact may be different. Uh, this is another great quote by Dr. Joe Nichols, and I just appreciated him, you know, bringing it back to earth that there might be new codes that are available to us, but they're, they're not new concepts that are being captured. It's just giving us a way to actually, you know, deal with those concepts and actually communicate them through the, the code itself. So a little history of IC10 and some myths surrounding it. I'm not going to go back to the, you know, the beginnings of IC10, but I do think it's important to kind of look at you know, where we came from, IC9, and how we're, we were, you know, how we're moving towards IC10. For some people, in the, you know, the last year might have been maybe the first time you've heard about IC10 or this change to IC10 that's looming, and I think that's, in some cases, has caused panic and things like that, um, and there's been some delays and things like that, but it is important to understand that IC10 and this transition have been a long time in the making. So if you look back at to Starsky and Hutch era, 1979, that's when we actually, the U.S. began using IC9 codes. That was 36 years ago. Um, the World Health Organization member states actually began using IC10 in 1994. So at that time, the U.S. postponed the adoption. That was 21 years ago that we had the opportunity to move to ICD-10. By 1995, the last major revision of ICD-9 had happened because the majority of the world was already using ICD-10. Again, that was 20 years ago. And then by 2008, the U.S. finally proposed the change to IC-10, and they proposed that it be effective 2013. So that was the initial ruling, is that we would all be on IC-10 by 2013. They gave us five years to do that. Um, 2012, it became apparent that industry-wide, everybody was not ready for IC-10. So CMS proposed that the IC-10 deadline be delayed for one year, setting it to 2014. And they were pretty firm about that and um, that it wasn't going to be changed and things like that. But to everybody's surprise, um, March of 2014, as everybody was moving forward to IC-10 in an SRG bill that was passed through the Senate, um, to everyone's surprise, the IC-10 that wasn't even discussed on the Senate floor was a part of that bill. So um, as a result of that billing, of that bill being passed, IC-10 was delayed one more year. The new deadline is October 1st of 2015, and that's when we'll join the rest of the world by adopting IC-10. So what are some of the myths about IC-10 that we hear? Um, one is that your software vendor is going to take care of all the needed changes for you. Another one is that IC-10 is only going to affect the biller or that there's no need to budget for IC-10 implementation, um, or that you have plenty of time to prepare for IC-10 implementation. 
So when it comes to IC10, this is not the time that you want to stick your head in the sand. If you think back through the changes over you know, the last decade, I know I've been here through the changes with MPI, new claim forms, ANSI 5010 requirements, and my experience in the industry is that I've seen that the effect it has on providers who choose to delay and take the risk and those that um, plan and prepare and move forward ahead of time. And that, unfortunately, I've seen some providers that have gone months without getting paid over something that would seem little like a new NPI number. So the takeaway, the facts about it is that um, for IC10, the software vendors are going to take care of some of the needed changes. So we're going to help you where we can help you but IC10 is bigger than just your software. Um, IC10 is going to affect more than just your biller. It's going to check the office manager, the position, the entire office, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Another myth is that you actually do need to budget for IC10 implementation, so myth buster, I should say. Uh, there's lots of things to consider when it comes to trainings, operational slowdown, claim rejections, and ramping up for the new code. So budget is something definitely to consider. And again, the time factor, you do have time to start if you start to make this implementation happen if you start preparing now. I want to play a little bit of game here. Um, when it comes to IC10, I think sometimes people roll their eyes because uh, the media and things like that present it in such a way that it almost seems ridiculous that we're having to move to ICD-10. I actually took this from PBS. Um, they had a little a little article about you know what you what ICD-10 is going to offer us, and this was their example: is that you know if a patient were to come in, were they bitten by a turtle or were they struck by a turtle? And under ICD-10. Now we can differentiate if they were bitten or struck and which encounter it was and things like that. Or another one of those extreme examples would be, hey, have you been burnt by a flaming water ski? And oh, look at how many codes we have under IP10 that would indicate um, information about that burning water ski. So with examples like that out there, it's easy, again, for us to roll our eyes and think, why the heck are we going through this big change if that's all it's going to give us? So I'm going to cover, there's, there's actually quite a few reasons why IC10 is important, but I just kind of picked out the top three that stood out. The number one um, reason, I would say, is for public safety. We're, if you look at even the definition of ICD, international statistical um, classification of diseases. It, ICDs were, were created as a way for us to communicate that um, you know, across the world where language might be a barrier, the code itself could indicate some of that, those changes. So this is, a, a, this is taken from an article that discusses the rapidly accelerating pace of pathogen discoveries and the risk of new infections and the importance of identifying infectious disease outbreaks early to prevent threats to public health. So if you think back again, this ICD-9 has been around since 1979, and I look at all these little dots and things on this map of, of um, discoveries and, and new um, infectious diseases that have occurred since 1979 you know, are we limiting ourselves with the code set that we have right now? Um, so a new game, you can't diagnose that in IC9. One that I think hits home to all of us is the Ebola breakout. So if you look at under IC9, which is what we're using today, we can only encode that as other specific disease due to viruses, which could be a whole slew of things, right? But the rest of the world under IC10 can actually specifically identify through their coding um, the Ebola virus. So again, our communication with the world and our ability to, to track these threats to public health and, you know, and our ability to respond to that is limited simply by the codes that, that we're using. So number two, and I guess these really aren't in any specific order because this one I would say is equally important, and that's patient safety. 
ICD-9, it's like driving our old Pintos back in the day. It might have been great in that day, but there's there's a lot better versions available to us now. Like, would we want to go back to one of those cars uh, when we can talk to our cars now and we can, you know, even on the radio this morning I heard about the, the, the car that's being released that can drive without being manned. So would we want to go backwards? Um, IC9, as it is, really is, is old and obsolete. We're very limited. There just is no room for a new expansion there because of the five-digit codes and that we've used up the spaces. There's, as new things come, there's nowhere for us to add those in. So ICD-9 is also limited in the specificity in the diagnosis. So we can't capture the same level of detail or risk or severity. And that is actually quite important to um, better patient care. This is another, um, Ricardo Martinez shared his experience with IC9 um, on the CMS website. And I think it's important, besides just communicating with the entire world, we do have an ever-increasing need to communicate between physicians. The last 30 years have seen such a great advancement in medicine. Um, and with that advancement has really become a significant increase in the number of specialists. So the result of that is that we need to better collaborate and coordinate between physicians. Um, so simply put, IC9 has its limitations in our ability to communicate through the card itself. Um, Dr. Martina shared a story about how he had a patient with an acute stroke that had a history of a previous stroke. And he had to spend time searching through old records to identify whether the previous stroke was on the left or the right side. And he just pointed out that he was wasting valuable time that he could have been dedicating to treating the patient if that same information had been available to him or been identified in a single IC10 code. And his point was simply better data makes better care possible. And the third, you know, I'd say top reason is that better data can also equal better reimbursement. So with the granularity in the codes, um, providers should expect more accurate payment structure over time. So greater claim accuracy, fewer denials and underpayments, fewer bills, inefficiencies, and reimbursement processes. So if there's more detail, in other words, sent on the claim to, you know, demonstrate medical necessity of why certain procedures were done or risk or severity, um, then there should be less uh, request for supporting documentation and things like that. Today, we have a lot of those requests, again, simply because it can, the codes can't be as specific. Um, and again, ability to differentiate reimbursements based on the complexity and outcomes. And Dr. Martina shared, or I'm sorry, Dr. Nichols shared um, how the code itself can, can provide much more detail when it comes to severity and risk. And this was an example that he gave of, you know, an open fracture of the, the femur. Under IC9, there's only 16 codes available to code that. But when you're talking about a fracture, a fracture can have multiple pieces. Um, you could be seeing a patient for an initial counter. The type of fracture, you know, A through C, would indicate the severity of the fracture. And, you know, the, the severity is very important because it, he explained that a type 1A fracture could be rinsed out and put on antibiotics. And there's really low risk of infection where a type 3C almost always ends up in amputation. So there's a huge variance in the type of fractures. And that's why it's so important to capture it in the code because that would indicate the level of risk and severity. And again, that could justify some of the procedures that were done and the reimbursements um, for treating a patient. So what is the impact of IC10? The impact is actually quite big. It's the biggest thing that's happened in the healthcare in, in 30 years. So the AAPC did this nice little diagram where they took the typical physician office and all the different roles in the office, and then they made a list of for each and every role, how they might be impacted by ICD-10. So when, 
when people think, well, it's just a billing issue. Well, it's not just a billing issue. We use ICD-10 on more than just our claims. So it is important to understand the, the impact so that we can properly prepare for the resources that we need to be making available and the changes that need to happen. So what will it take? Um, it is going to take resources. It's going to take more than just a group of mystical creatures coming and waving their wand. You'll, you'll need to ha have some plans in place and people, you need to give time, training, and tools. It's going to take some empowerment, providing authority to succeed, some oversight, so knowing what needs to be done, who needs to be doing it, what's going to be happening next. It's going to take some coordination, so synchronizing efforts throughout the office the office so that there's not duplicity in what's being done. Um, this is probably one of the biggest ones is contingencies, the big what if. Because we haven't been through a change like this in 30 years. Um, we weren't on electronic, rec you know, we, we weren't in the electronic world 30 years ago when ICD-9 was introduced. There are a lot of, of unknowns or what ifs and there needs to be planned in place. Um, for the things that, that could happen. And then the last thing, of course, is it's going to take some vision. We need to have a road map. Um, so it is, I'm going to talk for a minute just about the expenses of ICD-10. Unlike all the other government initiatives like the EHR incentive program or e-prescribing and things like that, this is an unfunded mandate. So you simply you know, with those other programs, there's some um, carrot and stick and some funding and incentive money. With this one, it's simply you've got a code on ICD-10 or else your, your claims are going to get rejected and you're not going to get paid. So the cost of this is important to consider. This is the, the land, you know, projections from the landmark study that was done back in 2008 when ICD-10 was mandated. And you can see for a small practice, which is usually where our physicians fall, about three physicians, you know, one to three physicians, two administrative staff, they actually projected it to cost about $83,000. Um, some of the key expenses that made up that cost, you can see a big chunk was for increased documentation, um, followed by cash flow disruption. About almost $20,000 was allocated to cash flow disruption. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then it hit on training and education, business processes, super bill changes, and IT changes. So the financial impact, who is it going to affect and why? The, if you look at each of those key roles in the office, managers who may be responsible for revising the super bill, so there's, there may be some cost to that, and there may be some consideration about whether or not that's even feasible anymore. For physicians and clinicians, um, you know, there's some, some training time involved that it's going to impact more than just the bills. It's going to impact lab orders, outside procedures, referrals, authorizations may take longer. Um, so all those things need to be considered, as well as the time that it takes to code. For coders, there's a learning curve. Um, they're expecting a slowdown of of about 20% in coding productivity. So, of course, that slowdown can affect the revenue coming in. Um, and then another thing to consider is that for bill is the amount of time that it's going to take to work re at rejections and denials. Um, once October 1st hits, how easy is it going to be to, when you get a denial, to even get a hold of your insurance companies to work through those? because the insurance companies are going to be on their own learning curve as well. So, and then, again, the cost to learn now, you know, right now of, of getting IC training. For payers, um, we're looking at we need to go through some testing with payers. We'll talk about that in a future webinar under ICD-10, some details around that. But, again, some of the things that may be expected, some things you should consider in your contingencies is delays, how long it's going to take for them to respond and to get claims through. They're estimating about 30% reduction in pay claims just right off the bat. Um, and then again, what impact is that going to have on our questions from patients as well? So the good news, well, sorry, the, the bad news is another study that was done by the AMA, a more recent study, was released February 2014, and they actually 
projected that the cost would be higher than previously reported. Again, everybody compares it to that 2008 study. Um, the good news is in November 2014, another report came out saying that the cost um, will probably be a lot lower than previously reported. This study kind of um, broke down some of the different, they actually estimated it more around um, two to $6,000. But as you look at a breakdown of theirs compared to the 2008 study, you can see that while they're saying, hey, you know, the cost of the software and IT changes is probably not going to be as high. Um, and even the documentation changes, like if you're already using an EMR, things like that, um, to, you know, be detailed enough in your documentation to support the specificity that's in these new codes. Um, if they they are kind of accounting for that because of some of the other programs like the EHR incentive program and things like that, that physicians may have already upgraded, may have already updated IT um, and had things in place. So that would reduce some of that cost. And there are a lot more resources available today than there were um, back in 2008 new training options online. We're even ahead of where we were, again, a year ago. So um, so they actually kind of deleted out a lot of those costs. I will say, though, that one thing that they did not account for in their numbers were the cash flow disruptions. And I think um, the, the other study in, in February of 2014, that's one of the things that they said, you know, they might have underestimated that cash flow disruption. So point being is there is going to be some financial impact to IC10. It is going to affect the entire office and we need to be aware of that and um, again properly plan and prepare. So what do you do next? Our recommendation is that you make a plan. Um, there are lots of tools and resources out there that cover like uh, what your plan should look like, the, the different phases that you're going to go through. They've talked specifically about you know software and education and um, testing and things like that. Um, we're not going to cover it today, but our next few webinars in the IPD10 series, we are going to talk about the tools that are available in your software that are going to help you with that ICD-10 transition. So hopefully we can, we can help you check off some of those things on your plan, um, like your vendor readiness. We are ready for ICD-10, and we're happy to help you through that transition. Uh, we're also going to talk about um, every single one of the, the plans that are out there. We're going to talk about testing. So we're going to answer some of the questions about testing and the, the myths and the things that you need to be doing to prepare for that. Um, and we'll also talk about some of the other features and um, tools that we have available to assist you with the transition to make it easier. So important thing is to start. One of the wonderful resources that is now available um, to you that we didn't have a year ago is, is Road to ICD, sorry, RoadTo10.org. So CMS has actually created Road to 10 to help you start jumpstart your transition to IC10. There's tons of information action plans, videos, training um, that are available at their site, and I'd encourage you to, to visit it. So to wrap up our webinar today, again, thanks for joining us. One of the best ways you can stay informed and learn about other training opportunities and even find answers to support questions is actually to subscribe to our blog, and you can do that at www.azcomp.com forward slash blog. Um, right there on the main side, on the right-hand side, there's a subscribe option. It's really the best way that we can um, communicate to you and keep you informed. Um, we hope that you will also join us for the remainder of our IC10 webinars, where, again, we're going to go into more detail on our products and how we can help you to make it a smooth transition. So if you have not registered for those webinars yet, please look for an email from ASCOMP where you'll get the details on how to register. And always feel free to call us at 877-544-4433. Um, thanks for your time and for attending today.